along with Senator Len Fasano and State Representative Laura Hoydick from the 120th in uh, Stratford, Connecticut. Laura, it's great to have you on the show. And today's topic is going to be energy and the laws and legislation we've passed over the last couple of years. I'd like to uh, welcome Laura and Len. And, uh, Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Len. It's nice to be here again. It's good to have you again. I know the last time you were here, we were talking about storm damage we were. and how to repair it and what was going on. And uh, so why don't you fill us in what's happened in the energy world because it's so important to the state of Connecticut for businesses and homes and what we can expect and what's going on. Why don't you give us a little bit of a detail? So the focus this year primarily was consumer protection on a variety of issues. Uh, electri electricity purchasing by third parties and uh, suppliers and also consumer protection as far as tree trimming from the utility companies. And that's been our primary focus for two of the major bills that we passed this session. One was two years ago, 6360 was Comprehe Comprehensive Energy and SP2. SP2 was the consumer protection for right. electricity purchasing of a third party supplier. Laura and myself actually sit on energy technology together and it's been a really, it's really a pleasure working side by side and you being ranking member. I did uh, Failed to mention, Laura's a ranking member of the Energy Technology Committee. And then the comprehensive, not the uh, SP2, when we had the fix for the, the third party suppliers, there was a real problem really the last couple winters with the spikes of energy to all consumers if you opted not for UI or CLMP, but to direct energy and any of those other companies. Do you want to discuss that at all? Yeah, um, what, it, what had happened was people were used to buying their utilities or their electricity specifically in this case from their local utility company. And it was um, rate controlled and regulated by then DPUC, which is now Pura. Things have changed slightly because now we have a market of choice and we can buy our own energy and consequently can save significant dollars if you have an idea of what you're doing and if you're conscious about contract expirations. It's very similar to buying a credit card or using, using a credit card, paying a fee, and then recognizing one interest rate is higher than the other. Well, it's the same thing with an energy marketer. So if I'm buying energy and I can pay seven cents a kilowatt hour, which is a great price, because right now UI is nine or 10 cents, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna save some money. However, what I didn't realize was that when my contract expired, there was an, a, a holdover or a rollover rate that made my electricity go up to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So people were caught in that, um, right. in that situation and it was, it was very disheartening to see a lot of people who didn't realize that they would have to pay these high costs. And that was happening with commercial as well. I know that yes. I was involved where we did purchase through a third party um, electrical rates and initially the introductory offer was low without reading everything that went through it would jump up or it would just change over time it's locked in for a year and that was the sort of bait rate is what I would call it get you in and then it would go up so I think this bill addressed those issues to say listen there has to be something for the consumer and more of where the sort of consumer can better pick what rate to, pit to be in and what contract to be involved in. That's correct. And there's also other ways that the consumer become, can become more aware. Through the Comprehensive Energy Strategy, we have EnergyICT.com, which shows all rates for all third-party marketers. It also shows the rates for all the local utility companies. So the consumer can go to a website. They can also look at their utility bill because there's pamphlets inside of that. But they, they have those options at their fingertips. The other thing that um, we prevented was when you do contract with a third market, uh, third party provider, your cancellation has to be very apparent to you. So your contract is ending, you have 30, 60 days, notice comes to you. So you have that opportunity to either shop around to stay with that provider or to go back to the local utility. And also under this new bill, we, you could actually lock into a certain rate, fixed rate for is it up to three months? No, you can, you can or lock six in. Months. You can lock in to a rate, for my contract for a year, you could go to 18 months, but your introductory rate, it can't, it can't be a flash in the pan, like Len said, a bait and switch kind of thing. It can't be a three month rate, and then um, it has to be more defined, is what I'm trying to say. And I think what's, what's, what people have to understand is you have a right to shop around for the best rate. So if you have UI now, that may or may not be the best rate. Chances are you could probably get it for a little less by going th to a third party. Um, and you could get that off of your bill that comes in, right? Mm -hmm. There's a little pamphlet. Mm -hmm. Or you go to which website? It's EnergizeCT.com. EnergizeCT.com. So go there and take a look because there's an opportunity to switch to a lesser rate. 
uh, save a, some, some money on the deal, and it would make sense. And there's no harm in trying to find out. You know, one of the things Governor Malloy wanted to do way back when was for those people who didn't pick a, a third-party provider is auction those off he did. and alleged right. to make some money for the state. That's how desperate uh, the administration got to put money in their budget. Right. And, uh, you know, the legislature, Republicans and Democrats said, that's not fair. People don't know they have a right to switch, and they shouldn't wake up the next morning and found out, find out at some auction your bill was auctioned off to another person. That wasn't right. So I'm glad we kind of put a halt to that. And that was a bipartisan halt. That was, and, that, and that's an excellent point. So we're, we're trying to make consumers more savvy. We're trying to give them market choices because the market choice will, will keep the price down. However, if you're saying, well, if you're standard offer, you're going to be auctioned, or if you're a third party, you can stay that way. It, it was at cross purposes, and it didn't really make any policy sense. Right. And how about um, as far as expansion of natural gas? We passed two years ago the expansion of it, but also for home uh, heating oil customers for the tax credits through, through the UI in our area or CLMP. We could the, discuss that. The tax credits for energy efficiency, upgrading for, your, your equipment so correct. you consume less energy and cost you less theoretically. A new boiler for, mm -hmm. for furnace, whatever it might be. The, also, that energyct.com gives you those options too about who you can go to for, with a supplier or who you can go to with a vendor. Um, a home heating oil company may increase your boiler efficiency. It may cost you a little bit more initially. You can uh, pay for it on bill financing. There's other financing options which is why we have the Connecticut Green Bank, which also helps consumers pay for these energy efficiency upgrades. You know, one of the things that um, we, we actually heard about in the last couple of days was that CLNP, which is really not in this area, it's UI, but CLNP is going to raise its electrical rates looking for an increase. And the reason why they're looking for an increase is their argument is with conservation, uh, that people have done a great job here in Connecticut, there's less energy being consumed. And therefore, there's less revenue coming into CLNP, and therefore, to upkeep their equipment, and uh, you know, we all want the grid to be safe for a bunch of reasons, uh, whether it's hackers or physicalness of the wires being intact. Uh, they say they have to raise the rates because they don't have enough revenue coming in, and that's one of the reasons. It seems to me that there's this unique conflict. We're telling folks. Go to our websites, get this energy efficient stuff. We give credits for it as a legislature because we want green, we want solar, we want wind, we want less off the grid. Then we get people to get off the grid and reduce it. And now we're saying, thank you for reducing it. Oh, by the way, you're going to have to pay more for less energy because CLMP needs more money. And I understand that unique balance between making sure that CLNP or UI eventually needs money to keep their equipment running and upkeep. But when you set a policy that says, gee, be energy efficient, save money, but then we're going to tax you more, call it a tax, or pay more for that electricity. I think first CLNP, in my view, Pura needs to look at CLNP and say, what have you done to economize your scale? Mm -hmm. Have you reduced your assets? Have you looked at ways to uh, give energy out cheaper before you go to the well and ask Connecticut residents who are already paying one of the highest rates in the nation to pay more. And I'm a little bit concerned that a CLMP gets this increase uh, without this look into their system. We're going to see UI saying, hey, they did it, now we're going to try for it. And we're already the highest in the country, or one of the highest well, in the nice country. Too. What do you think, Laura? I agree, Len. It's very disenfranchising and it's disconcerting. And for a variety of reasons, especially with CLNP, because the way the nation goes or the CLNP goes, UI is going to go the same way. And those are the two utility companies outside of the municipals in Connecticut. So it's it's of concern. And here's the other part. You, you hit the nail on the head. So Pura, who regulates this rate, will, will look at the operations of CLMP and look at their economies and what they've done to reduce costs or become more efficient. Now, our good friend, Senator Chapin, just lost his call center and his work center in New Milford for CLMP. They had a, a fairly big operation. They downsized or they closed it, and they dispatched different people other ways. So if they're going to make those kind of savings, which may be okay, and I'm not sure because I think there's some job loss there, 
how can that you then turn around and say, I need a rate increase of, I don't know, how much it was? It's nine fifty per a homeowner per month. Uh, now, okay, now. so it's $16 to $25.50. So are going to go to 25 and change, okay. yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Which is a, a substantial uh, increase. And the problem when we had all the storm outages over the last couple of years, uh, they were large storms, but in many cases it was lack of man or woman power as far as being on the ground. And if they're thinking about raising the rates like this, you should not, you know, like you said, like clerks, uh, his area, lay people off. I mean, right. it's counterproductive, really. You want more money, but you want to lay people off also for efficiencies. And then they did outsource. They did some privatization. And so that's why Pure has got to take all of that into account. <coughs> and so if you're doing these things to save your operating costs, why are you increasing rates to consumers? That doesn't make it. It doesn't, it doesn't jive. Right. And, 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 and that's a great point. And I'd like to see them look at also the issues of what else are you doing to, in the next five years, to keep your costs in check or reduce your costs? I mean... I don't know anything about energy, other than turn a switch, the light goes on. But it seems to me that technology is so advanced that there's got to be a more efficient way of doing things, even at this energy level. And I think those hard questions have, have to be asked. Before we allow this increase to go in mm -hmm. and put us way off the charts in terms of the highest rate, um, I think we need to be sure that Pure is going to do its job. And in my view as a legislator, if Pure doesn't do their job on this, then we need to enact legislation, and I, I think the Energy Committee in particular needs to look at this, to enact legislation almost as a checklist that require Pure to do certain things and write up a reason as to why they gave them the increase, what the basis is, you know, something that there's a record. Because, look, we gave it to Pura because if they came to the legislature, we would say no because of, you know, the people electing us would say, if you go up, I'm not voting for right. you. So we put it in this, quote, unquote, non-political body to make these decisions and look at it. And I get that. And, and it's a telecommunication tower and all that kind of makes sense to me. But we as legislators have to make sure that Pura is going to do their job and a job that's going to ensure that everything is looked at before we go to the rate holder. Because we ensure that CLNP makes a profit. That's what we do. We do. And if we're going to ensure, and it's, you know, I wish they did that with my business, and Dave wishes they did that <laughs> with sure. his business, <laughs> since we had our own business, that the state came out and said, Dave's going to make a profit. You know, there's a certain amount of risk. But when we underwrite the risk, before we give them an increase and hurt people, we need to make sure they're doing everything in their power to deliver it the most efficiently, the cheapest way, but still protect the grid and the costs that, that need to go on for maintenance. And Does that make sense? It abs you absolutely make 100% sense. And here's the other thing that consumers don't know. When Pura opens this docket for this rate increase, they have the right to testify. They can submit written testimony or they can actually show up and testify because it's very similar to a court proceeding. Um, but I would say this. I've been in front of Pura. I like to cause controversy. I've been, <laughs> I've been in front of Pura, and they were putting in the high wire tensions, the, the high wire, the 345 cables, oh, yeah. okay. through Walling for other mm -hmm. parts of the state. And I found them to be arrogant. I found them to be self-centered, disrespectful. The people came up, kind of like, okay, you threw testifying, let's move on. And in Fairfield area where the money was, the wires went underground. And in your area and my area, they wouldn't even talk about it. And why? Because their argument was, well, the land's more expensive down there. Well, you know, my people matter as much as any other people as far as constituents. Mm -hmm. And you go by Pilgrim's Harbor, which I forgot the name of the golf course it is now. Tradition. Traditions. Mm -hmm. They all go through there. They could have put those yeah. under. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. And Pura just took this arrogant attitude that bothered me so much. Same thing with the wind en energy. When they want to put the wind turbines in, we wanted regulations. They wanted to have that uh, they could waive any regulation they wanted to waive. Yeah. And in that bipartisan uh, regs review committee, we all held out till we got what we wanted. And that was a bipartisan effort to do that. And I pat every one of those members on the back. But I found them to be so out of touch with everyday people uh, as if they were some court outside the touch of everyone. And that's what me as Len Fasano State Center, Len Fasano constituents of North Haven, 
uh, have a concern with and I look at them with very squinty eyes because I don't have the trust I should have in them. Well, they should have the same standards for all towns, and they don't. And we actually could enact that in the future, but let's, I'd like to see what happens and, you know, with them. If this comes to the, it's going to come in front of them, I would think. But they really need to have the same standards for energy or, or maintenance or technology throughout the whole state. Not, it can't be for one town and not for the next town. It's, it's very hard, and that's why you have a siding council, because right. each town is different, and they do have different land use and zoning boards and, and, and ordinances. But let me just go back to DPUC versus Pura, because you testified before DPUC. Pura is a slightly different body. Even though it's regulatory, even though there's three commissioners, well, actually there were five in DPUC, and now there are three. Um, this Pura body actually goes on the road to constituents. They were in Milford, they were in Fairfield, they were in Bridgeport, um, that's my area, which is why I'm talking about it, but they specifically went there to talk about this consumer electricity third party marketing problem. They go on the road, and I think they're a friendlier, um, Jack's still there, so he was there in the previous administration, but I think they're a little more open, a little more customer service, and willing to listen. And again, if you don't want to go and testify, I know that's your bailiwick and you're good at it, but it, <laughs> I'm not good at it. I can submit written testimony or s c submit my opinion. And I want to share with you how that worked very effectively for um, Aquarion, well, it worked for the con constituents and the consumers who were opposing the Qu Aquarion r water rate increase because we were able to submit electronically and, um, and the rate did increase did not go through. We have to talk about also by, I think you were there, Len, at the time. I don't think you were in the office at the time, but Connecticut has got an agreement to have 20% of renewables by 2020. Mm -hmm. And we've worked, worked very hard the last couple of years to meet those goals to get to this point in 2020. Um, so do you want to discuss some of the legislation we passed for the uh, solar, wind, microgridding, uh, sure. of course the, the, the natural gas, the, uh, we're looking for the Algonquin line in, by 2018, which hopefully will lower our energy, co energy costs. And Iroquois has also put in a, a request for expansion, so that's the northern part of the state, so that's a, another thing, a good thing. Um, I love planning, and I'm a natural planner because if I have a, a, a path in front of me and I can check it off right. as I go, it just makes sense. If we can do it collaboratively around a table, then everybody has this buy-in, and it usually stent, tends to stand the test of time because there's so many people that are participating. This comprehensive energy strategy was just that. We brought in all the stakeholders and a lot, a lot of constituents, right. a lot of advocacy groups, a lot of people in industry to talk about what do we need to do. And one of the first things was to hold the renewables so that we could reach our goals for 20 to, at 2020 and also to reduce our costs for, for power and, and natural gas and heating because it was just stifling us. It's stifling us, our growth economically, and people can't, couldn't afford to pay these prices. And that's what this comprehensive energy strategy really does. It looks at different ways of making renewables not so excessive and not so expensive as they were at 30 cents a kilowatt hour for solar or 40 cents a kilowatt hour but giving us options that if those costs were that high, we had a trigger that would allow us to use other renewables, sustainable renewables like water right. and hydropower. <clears throat> and I'm really proud of that legislation. There's a lot of things too. There's a, it's a big bill. It's, that over, was, <laughs> it's that over 300 pages. That so was, was my first bill. year on the committee, yeah. and I think I came in just as the year started, and that was a lot, a lot of work. When you did a great job as ranking member, along with the chairs Thank on the you. other side, but it was really a good, I think a good bill. It takes going to take a little time because of all the triggers, all the things we have to overcome. As far as like the Algonquin line, we need that natural gas uh, by 2018. We, there's a shortage every winter because of the demand for natural gas and energy, right. but I, we're on the right track. And uh, that's what happens because there's a transmission line restriction. It makes that commodity that much more expensive. And when, when there's a shortage, what do you do? You end up paying more for right. it. And that's, that's what we experienced in the winter last year. But as we're working to lower energy costs, our governor raised the generation tax two or three years ago? Was it three years ago? Yep, yep. He, um, it was um, Dominion, the nuclear power plant, was the one right. that hit us worst. But <clears throat> they paid a two cent tax on generation, and it was just a, a crazy thing to do. Which passed on to all of us. It's passed on to the Absolutely. consumer, and that's the sad part. That has, that has um, gone away, though. Let's, Right. For sunsetted. two years. That has been sunsetted. Oh, sunset. Yeah, at sunset. Okay, that's yeah. right. Twenty. So, but, the, the but that's one of those conflicting things when you talk about. Well, I'm going to lower. I'm going to. We need to lower energy costs for consumers, right. and then there's a tax on it. Well, that tax, just like all the gas taxes, gets passed on to the consumer. Well, speak, speaking.